And uh, Emily will be talking about dinosaur face touch, fossil evidence for nerves and senses in ancient animals. Okay, how's it sound? Good? Good. All right, so we've heard a lot about reconstructing dinosaurs, how they come out from the field, what we know about their skeletons. Um, and I'm actually chasing um, what we can say about behavior in these animals. And to get to behavior, we rely on soft tissues, usually. Um, and as you might guess, um, dinosaurs, when we find them, don't have any soft tissues. So my job is to reconstruct these soft tissues, things like brains, that's an allosaurus up there, and that's its little brain, um, and then nerves also as those pass out into the skull. So I'm going to take you through um, how we do this and make pretty good hypotheses of what we think these animals were doing when they were alive. All right, so back when things were really, really early in evolution, um, early vertebrates or anything with a backbone, it, it, uh, this is the first time we saw a head. And the head was really, really specialized for one thing, that's eating. So you got these jaws, but then also with those jaws came a brain case. And the job of the brain case was to support the sensory system. So things that are common to us, like tongues, as you're uh, taking in taste or chemical senses, noses for smell, uh, eyes for vision, um, and ears for hearing. And one thing you might not think about when you think about the head is the sense of touch. So that's the one I'm going to focus on today. A lot of work has been done on these other senses, um, but I've decided to chase down uh, the sense of touch. So if you think about animals you might be familiar with, birds and lizards, um, you might not really think that they're using their sense of touch much, um, that's pretty true. So birds are largely specialized. They use their eyes to catch their prey. They can feel their faces um, if you touch them. If you look up in the lizards, there's these little dots all over its face, and those are, um, they uh, sense touch as it contacts it in the environment. We've got mammals. You might be familiar with whiskers. So if you watch a rat, um, moving its head around, it's touching its whiskers to its environment. This is a little more specialized and it's gathering a whole bunch of information and it tells it where its head is in space and where things are around it. And then we've got the extremes. <laughs> so these are things that are really, really good at their sense of touch to the point where they actually might reduce other sensory systems. So um, these birds, we know that their visual systems are a little less specialized because they um, they give a lot of energy to their uh, touch systems. So, some videos so you can see what I mean. All right, so in the bottom left, we've got a tentacled snake. Um, and what this animal is doing is, it's not using its eyes, it's using those little tentacles that stick off of its face to sense where that fish is, and then it can very quickly orient and grab the fish. The alligator up in the middle there is doing the same thing. So they're dropping a food pellet in the water in complete darkness, um, and it is orienting and snatching that food pellet. These birds are doing something a little different, so they're sticking their beaks down into this substrate, in this case it's sand, um, and they're using the vibrations of the critters down in the sand to sense where those are. So they can't see them at all, they're just using an organ at the tip of their bill called a bill tip organ to figure out where their prey is. So how are they doing this? They're doing it with a special nerve. So this is the trigeminal nerve. So the trigeminal nerve has several names. Trigeminal nerve, uh, tri for three, because it has three divisions, and we'll, I'll show you those in a second. It's cranial nerve five, because we number things in anatomy. Um, and V is the Roman numeral for five, so you'll see it as V. So the signals for face touch pass along this nerve, and you have it too, so if you touch your face, it's passing along this nerve up to your brain in the same way that it is in reptiles and other mammals and all vertebrates. So a couple structures that I'll talk about that'll be important later are this ganglion, and that's just a bundle of cell bodies. They, uh, the nerve passes through there, um, and it's a measurable feature that'll be important later. And then there's three divi divisions, one to the, uh, the upper face, one to the upper jaw, and one to the lower jaw. And I'll generally talk about that mandibular division uh, today. And we can do the same thing for reptiles. So here in an alligator, this is a CAT scan reconstruction, and I'll explain those in a second, um, but just to cover the anatomy, here's that ganglion, that ball of cells, and there's the three divisions out to the face. Um, and then these, in an alligator at least, 
they terminate in these sensory receptors. They have really, really densely packed sensory receptors on their snout that allow them to do that special behavior. Um, and so soft tissues are all great, but obviously we don't have these in the fossils. Um, but we can use these living animals. Um, we can understand how their soft tissues uh, relate to their skeletons. And this is true in reptiles. So that ganglion has to sit in a cavity in the skull and it passes out through a hole. And that's a measurable feature that's preserved in the fossil record. Also the passageway of the nerve through the lower jaw is also preserved really well in reptiles. So to get at understanding the sense of face touch in reptiles, I decided to look at how these soft tissues relate to these hard tissues um, and how these relate to behaviors we see in living animals. So I studied reptiles all across the tree. So we've got these lizards and snakes, we've got crocs, and we've got birds. Because these create a really, really, really excellent bracket or basis of knowledge for what we can say about the dinosaurs that fall in there between. And we've got extremes from all across. So if we can compare the anatomy of our extreme guys to the anatomy of our non-extreme things that are focused on their other senses, maybe we can make a hypothesis about soft tissues and dinosaurs and what that means for their behavior. All right, so how in the world would you do this? So start off, I get to head out to museums with my giant forceps, um, and that tank, the tank on the ground there is like, I don't know, I could lay in it. Um, it's full of really, really nasty alcohol. Um, and I get to pull specimens out of there, all sorts of reptiles, birds, snakes. Um, and some of these are really cool. They're from the far back as the 20s, I think that one in the top corner um, is. So it's collection might have been unethical, but we get to study it, which is really, really great. Um, and then we CAT scan it. So most of my living animals were sent down to University of Texas, and their CAT scanner doesn't look like one that when you go to the hospital, you go through that donut. Um, but this does the same thing. It takes a whole bunch of x-rays, and then um, you can reconstruct the structure of interest down through those slices, and then the computer builds you a nice 3D model of what you're seeing. So here we've got the 3D reconstructions of some living animals, so a bird and a an knoll, or that's a parrot and a an knoll lizard and that alligator again. Um, so I'll show you what some data looks like. And this involves a lot of coloring. You sit in a dark room on a computer and you flip through. Sometimes there's like 3,000 slices you have to go through. And color in the brain, color in the nerves. So the brain is there in blue. We're looking at slice through the head. Um, and then you can also reconstruct things in 3D, so those are the nerves as they pass through the lower jaws. Um, and then you measure your features, so we can measure uh, 3D volumes of the ganglia or the bundle of cell bodies. Um, and we can, I also came up with a system of quantifying those structures you see at the bottom, so the nerves as they pass through the jaw. So real simple, you take that thing, you simplify it to uh, a stick model. You apply numbers, you calculate those, and you plot them. If you want to know more, there's a whole lot more that's not important. <laughs> <laughs> and then you compare them. So first off, we're comparing the soft tissue features of the living animals. So on that bottom axis, you're going to have the large animals on the right. So that's why the crocs are going to be on the right there. The smaller animals are going to be on the left, like lizards and birds are usually somewhere in between. On the other one, you have the, the soft tissue features. So again, large features are going to be on the top, and small features are going to be on the bottom. So we throw up a whole bunch of uh, data points for living animals, you get this. And what you see is that larger animals have larger features, which is pretty expected. If you start to look in more detail on where those extremes are, they all kind of fall out in a group to the left. So if we apply an average, so that's all that line represents, it's just an average of the extreme ones and it's an average of the non-extreme ones. What we're seeing is that the larger animals with larger features are all using their faces um, as their, their prime, their main sense to capture their prey. So we can do the same thing for that canal. So comparing those extreme animals, um, basically, this is just representing how many tips they have and where they are along that canal in the lower jaw. Um, and it's pretty clear that these extreme animals have a lot all over the place, and the non-extreme animals don't. So you're more complex if you're using your face a lot for face touch. So what about fossils? What can we say about them? So to do this, 
it's a lot of measuring of these hard tissue features. So I get to, I got lucky and I got to head out right before the pandemic to all these museums across the country and measure these features by hand. And I also got to take CT scans of these fossils. So the really, really big ones um, you can take to a hospital and you throw them through that big scanner and they give you some pretty images. The smaller ones you can throw in a micro CT scanner, which oddly is larger than a, <laughs> it's larger than a, a scanner in a hospital, but it scans smaller images at higher res. So then you get a CAT scan of the bony features and then you can trace the pathways and where these nerves and brains used to be and make the same kind of predictions. And then statistics comes into play so you can use a computer programs to tell you was this animal using a lot of face touch or was it not based on what I know about living animals. All right, so we've got the theropods. So I sampled a whole bunch of dinosaurs, but these guys are probably the most interesting to, I don't know, a lot of people. So you've got the star Dilophosaurus. Um, for that guy, I had some lower jaws that I was able to pass, find out where the nerves pass through. Um, and look for patterns here, and maybe you can guess where we're going as we go through. Majungasaurus, so that bone on the left is its brain case. It's the part of the skull that held the brain and that the nerves then passed out of. So he was able to measure features on that and then also reconstruct the nerves as they pass through its lower jaw. And then there's a really nice Allosaurus, a Dinosaur National Monument. If you've been there, it's the one in the case. So Rebecca back there helped me take that to Vernal and we threw it through the medical scanner. Um, and that I've got a really nice brain reconstructed for and the nerves as they pass through the lower jaws. And everyone's favorite, T-Rex. So again, there's a brain case, so I was able to measure features on that and then lower jaws as well. And then here's another one, Varanosaurus. Um, that one doesn't really have a brain case, but there's, but there's a nice lower jaw. So these are some of the examples. There are a couple more and then I have duplicates of several of these. So I'm going to throw up a similar plot as before. This one's a little different because this is measuring those bony features instead of the soft tissue features. So again, the animals that are extreme are that average and the non-extreme animals uh, are this other average. Ignored down where they get real small, things get kind of weird. I don't really know what that means yet, but I'll figure it out. So where are the dinosaurs going to be? They're going to be big, so they're going to be on the far end of the graph, but we don't know where they're going to be up and down. So we throw them on there. The theropods fall out in between. So they're intermediate in size. So complexity, maybe you can guess because we looked at some of those lower jaws. There they are in yellow. So we've got the extreme animals have a lot of tips and they're all over the place. The non-ones have very few. And the dinosaurs are in between. So I mean, that may not be, I don't know, I think it's interesting. Um, they are intermediate in both their size and complexity, and when you compare them statistically, so I crunched the numbers, it comes out that they have a sense of face touch that's somewhere between something like one of those crocs or one of those birds, and then in between something like ooh, those, those uh, lizards and other types of birds. So what are they using those for? That's always the question I get, and I'm really, really hesitant, because we don't have very many living animals that we know fall out in between. Um, but potential options are prenatal care. If you're, um, and you've got to think about that these animals don't use their hands for a lot of things, so they're using their face as a tool. So if they need to care for their young, or they travel through a lot of underbrush and they need to figure out what's touching them in the face, or they need to discriminate between what they're eating, they might use the sense of face touch for something like that. But not to the extent of a croc. They're probably also incorporating their eyes. Um, their nose and hearing and other senses as well. So lots of people helped with this. Um, so there's a quick summary of all of those. And then I'll take any questions you might have. Uh, is there any thermal element to the, the use of the mouth senses or the just around the mouth? Yes, yeah, so in animals, in some snakes, they have that thermal sensor that they use to, they have um, pit organs on their face and that, that takes in thermal information. And the same nerve goes to these. Largely in reptiles, the nerve is going to these touch sensors. So I have no reason to suspect that it has a thermal aspect in, in these guys, but it can do that and it is seen doing that in reptiles.
Have you observed a difference in kind of the environment in which the animal lives? So an aquatic animal like an alligator, does it have more nerves because it lives in an aquatic environment and just from the water that it contacts? Um, does that hold true to, to dinosaurs as well? Yeah, so that's a good question because you do see that the animals I showed were in water and that's because water is really, really good at passing those signals along. So if you live in water, it's really useful to have that sense of touch. I haven't gotten to, you know, Spinosaurus is like the one everyone wants to know about and I don't have a scan of that. I haven't taken any measurements of that one. So that'd be a good thing to chase. And there are other reptiles that we know that live in the water that I'm working on getting data for. So. Do we know if their tongues have the same kind of like the pebbles that ours have, where it's all like textured and that's what they use for that mainly? Or do you think it's just like the jaw? Because it seems like it's all mainly the jaw. Yeah, so reptile tongues, this is a, this is a long, a long thing, but in lizards and snakes, there's two types of tongues. Um, one is a forked tongue, and that's actually taking uh, chemical senses from the environment, and that passes up through a different, a different nerve to the brain. Um, and then there's tongues that do like, uh, oh, I don't know, I think they're chameleons and things that are actually using their tongue as a tool. And then you have other animals like alligators where their tongue is just part of their, part of their mouth. I don't remember your actual question on but <laughs> <laughs> maybe that was useful. <laughs> What is, on average, the percentage of uh, creatures that had split tongues before and now? That I don't, that at Casey, you know, the percentage, I don't know. <laughs> How many of my gang have split tongues? How many politicians do we have today? <laughs> I don't know that, I don't know that either, but someone, someone does, and I'm sure it's published, the reptile groups that do versus, versus don't. Uh, okay, does the, um, does the size of the animal's brain cavity relative to its size have any effect on the sensitivity of its face? Like, if it has a bigger brain cavity, does that mean it's going to be more sensitive? So th this is a, that's a tricky one too, because um, there's brain size, there's brain density, there's number of connections within the brain that could make it a better processor. So that's a, that's a whole another thing that it, we can know that is taking in this information, but we don't know its processing capacity of that information back in the brain. So it's certainly related, but getting at that is a little harder because it's, it's pretty hard to reconstruct more than just their brain cavity. Um, <laughs> it looks like a lot of those were uh, carnivores. Is there like a reason? Is that just like kind of what you studied or is it that it's mostly carnivores that have this heightened sense of face touch, I guess. So, let's see. I was mostly in I was mostly in reptiles, and I guess I guess it was more just the animals that I had largely were carnivores. But but ducks aren't are I don't know omnivorous, and they're they're one group that we know of that has a really really heightened sense of face touch. As far as herbivores that would, I don't know if I have any good examples, but I do have, you know, some herbivorous dinosaurs sampled as well, and they tend to fall out intermediately or very, very low on the scale. Um, have you looked at age? Have you looked at age change in the senses? Like, have they changed during the age of the animal, and what stages do they? come out with more? That's a good question. Luckily, I was fortunate to study alligators from pre-hatching through hatching through grown. And basically, before they're hatched, they have this whole system already set up. So they're ready to go when they come out. And then it doesn't, it just grows in size. It doesn't change complexity or anything. And if you think about alligators, it makes sense. They're, they're hatched and they have, to, they have to immediately head out in their environment. And, they don't have much parental care. Where do humans sit on that spectrum you showed of um, animals that have high face sensitivity and low face sensitivity? Oh, I don't know. I, that I don't exactly know. I'd have to put us somewhere in between. We use, we use our lips for a lot, so our lips are very, very highly sensitive. But I don't have a, I don't have a good answer for you. <laughs> when was the first big mass extension, the extinction, sir? 
Anyone? <laughs> First big mass extinction? We talking like vertebrates? The end of the Triassic, right? I mean, the well, oh God, there's so many extinctions. <laughs> Depends on which groups you're talking about. Well, if there's no other questions, let's thank Dr. Lester.